Welcome, everybody. We are here. Q is in the house for Super Shares for the beginning of the school year. Super Shares, what can we do to really get the year started off strong? What can we do to build confidence and, and equity? What can we do to really start the year off with um, students at our hearts and pedagogy on our mind? Um, I'm Joe Marquez. I am the Director of Ac Academic Innovation for Q, and I have my good old buddy, my mentor, John Carippo, the Chief Innovation Officer for Q, now going back into the classroom. So, John, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, so I'm. I've, it's fun that I'm helping you kick this off, Joe, as part of our transition, right? Because I'm I'm pulling back and you're rolling in and and I'm getting ready to go to the classroom. So my head is full time. Like, how am I going to grow community? How am I going to grow culture? Uh, our, our, our superintendent wanted to be face to face. He was like, yes, we're going face to face and then got shut down. So, you know, now we got to do all that. So uh, it's very front of mind to me. I'm very excited to hear what Lisa's got to share. And um, it's I think it's going to be a really cool series we've got here where it's like 10, 15 minute bites of how to teach better right now. Absolutely. I mean, actual educators talking to educators with practical tips that they are actually using that are just catching fire everywhere and nothing more catching fire than HyperDocs, which is what Lisa is going to be talking about. But the, I'm going to show you why. This is the reason that we decided to do this, because right now we look at fall as this big ominous thing that's coming up. I mean, something like this. Right, where it's this, this, this struggle, this thing, this fall is coming. Oh, sorry, I was doing right? the voice. I was doing the <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, the special effects are are, are warranted. Um, oh yeah. But, but the thing about it is, you know, there might be some teachers out there saying, "Oh, we have to do distance learning," and we want teachers to say, "Yes, we get to do distance learning." And there's no other people on the planet that are so happy about this than all of our ed tech friends who have been asking for this for years and years and years, and they're like, "Yes!" And I want to bring Lisa in right now because right now, right now here she is, Lisa. Hey. How are you? Good. I loved your last sentence. I uh, that really struck a chord. I've been waiting for this moment, although it's you know everyone's experiencing it differently. So as a ed tech person, I'm waiting for that piece to it. You know. Well, I mean, like previously, it was kind of like you know I, I've been saying it's like the book Green Eggs and Ham. Like we were Sam saying, here, try it in your classroom. Yeah. Try it with Nearpod. Try it with Pear Deck. I'm too busy. No, I, I don't have time. I, I do not like ed tech, <laughs> Joe, I am. And then now it's just try it. Just try it. Like I do. I do like Nearpod and Spam or whatever, right? So now, but now it's like a buffet. Everybody's coming at it. I want it. I want it. I want it. And they're coming to you, Lisa. They're coming to you because HyperDocs is a phenomenal tool, an effective tool. And right now in distance learning, it's some, for some people, it might be one of the most effective tools um, in, that, in their arsenal of ed tech tools. So I want you to talk a little bit about HyperDocs, but yeah. then talk to us about how it can be used now in distance learning and when we go back to face-to-face -face and face-to-face -face atmospheres as well. Thank you. I um, am very excited about um, how HyperDocs really um, can really help in this moment. Uh, because uh, they are digital lessons that the teacher can create and give to the student. And the difference between a HyperDoc and like a digital worksheet that you might download is that you totally need to edit and create it and design it uh, with your students in mind, with their needs in mind, with your needs in mind. And I think that's a really important shift when we talk about last spring and the term was it was emergency uh, remote instruction. A lot of um, us are being asked to shift from um, emergency to this is the real thing. And I like to think of that in terms of can we shift from um, simply assigning work to instruction? How do you make that shift? How do we um, teach in this environment? And so for me, uh, one major solution that of course I love is HyperDocs because they were digital lessons, well, they always have been, meant to be in a blended environment. Now, it was meant to be on tech, off tech, they still are. Um, the only difference is you're not with them present physically in the classroom, so it's a little bit of different. That's what I'm gonna share with you, how to prepare for the start of your school year, um, making these remote uh, lessons that uh, you expect kids to learn off of. Now, your students come to you and they're really schooled in, tell me my task, what I'm supposed to do, 
and I'll just do it. And they just go through it like a worksheet, mm -hmm. just get her done. And, um, you know, and then I turn it in. Um, the teacher comes on with this workflow of, let me explain it to you. I'm going to lecture. That's the explain. Then they assign, they assign the work. And the kids get it done or don't get it done. And then they turn it in and you assess it and then you move on. Don't well, forget, you get the grade one to five days later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that feedback and that, you know. So with a hyperdoc, it's different. You're asking kids to explore content first, actively engage in that thinking um, before they get the explanation. Um, and that gives you an opportunity to see where your lecture needs to go. You can do that first format of assessment. How are they getting it? To what level are they getting it? Then you could adjust your explained portion and support your explained portion with your videos. Um, with your tutorials. That's where the explain comes in. Now, where does your Zoom call come in? You know, because we're supposed to be doing Zoom instruction. It is not the explain always. It's the, here I explained it. I want you to go apply it. Let's reflect on that application. And so I want to give you some tips on this. So I, I just went through the explore, explain, apply. But I want to share with you my tips because, and this is the same whether you're face to face with kids or whether you're remote, especially now. You cannot assume that students know how to learn on a digital lesson. We have really, um, that's been a huge aha. You give a, a kid a hyperdoc, <laughs> give, a, give a mouse a cookie. <laughs> no, I'm on, on the literature now. And, <laughs> and they look at it as they typically have been fed. We've been feeding the beans for a long time. And so they go through it and like, okay, I'm done in like 10 minutes. Now what do I do? So we really have to slow down and do some explicit teaching first. And my suggestion is I want them to feel competent with the web tools. And so I like to start slow. If I'm going to, let's say I'm going to use Adobe Spark a lot in the classroom, because it's going to be a part of my hyperdocs, part of the show, you know, the apply parts. I want to make sure I start the year off. And we're going to introduce Adobe Spark, but we're going to do it through community building. Low cognitive load. Go in first with something like, why don't you create an Adobe Spark video that tells me um, a, a favorite memory from your childhood or a little bit about yourself. Or favorite your, sports shoe. Yeah, you're, exactly. Favorite and, donut. You can go all day like that. Yeah, favorite um, taco. Um, and they don't have to take, um, it's really about focusing. They can focus on the concentrate on the on learning the tool and have that little bit of freedom and that flexibility and not focus on the content. Then when you come back around with your digital lesson and all of a sudden you're saying, all right, we just learned this um, concept in science. Now I want you to show me what you know in an Adobe Spark video. They then have that background knowledge has been built. Um, mm -hmm. I think though, if we, even when we start by that, um, it's very important. Sometimes we just give these assignments. Like I build a hyperdoc um, around that tool and around that process. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we have tons of them get to know you kind of building community ones under the guise of, um, we're not guys, we're, we are building community. It's really great. Um, but then there's so many layers we've added into that first step. But the really important piece you cannot forget, you have to reflect at the end on how the learning process felt. What did you do when you got stuck? What did you do when you got frustrated? All right, so you're great with tech because I know you're great with your Xbox and you always, if you get stuck on those games, you know how to get out of it. I want you to have that same attitude when you're stuck at home on math because I just tried it out on a brand new tool that was complicated and you had no problem. So can you take that same attitude as a, as a learning process and take time to reflect on that process? Now, my and Lisa, I'd like to just throw in real quick as a quick one is I love your idea, though, of getting to know the kids and getting to them to know each other yeah. by getting to them to know hyperdocs. Right. So there's this it's this trifecta of things. And I know many, many teachers right now are saying, hey, I can build culture face to face. But how do I do this with a flat screen? Yeah. And, and I just want to reinforce that. I think you're totally right there because you can do those scavenger hunts and those fun things in and, and you don't even have to call them hyperdocs at first. It's just a thing we're going to do, yes. right? Yes. And then as you get to know those kids, then you're building that safe place for the creativity they need later. I can't wait for the next one. What do you yeah. got? And I, and I want to say one thing. The reflection is absolutely necessary in education. And usually 
when we're in a face-to-face brick and mortar location, we have a finite time with our students and we always put the reflection at the end, but everything always takes longer than we expect. And so what do we do at the reflection? Oh, go do it on your own or go do it when you can or go. It's not, it's not as powerful. It needs to be done. But in a distance learning environment, we have all the time in the world. Reflect when you learn. Reflect when you get struggle. Reflect when you uh, have your aha moment. Now reflection can occur anytime, right? right? And so I think students can really empower themselves with that reflection piece. So I love it. You bet. And so then we're scrambling. We're like, okay, go to something like a Padlet or a Google Doc and post your thinking so all the classmates can see it because that's really important for them to get to know each other there. Uh, a little side tip, a little bonus. I'm giving you a little bonus within the bonus. Um, let them be anonymous also. Yeah. And to build that trust because we are plopping them into an environment. They don't know us. They don't know their classmates. That's really frightening. So if we're out there saying, just share all about you. Let them share some thinking and have that safe space and be anonymous on that Padlet. But also you slip in that digital citizenship lesson there too. I need to trust you kids. I'm going to let you be anonymous, but I'm going to trust that you're going to put accurate and appropriate comments. Um, And so, I mean, there's layer upon layer that you are teaching those procedures and structures in place first. It's really good to start off with this thing. I think it's called like smart something. Smart, smart, um, smart guy, smart, 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 so smart, smart, yeah, this um, is very much a part of it. Now, my next phase to this, because we know in a good hyperdoc, we have kids explore and then we explain and then we apply. I have found kids don't know what explore means. Adults don't know what explore means. I've done this with roomfuls of, of adults and they were like, I'm, I'm, I want They're you afraid to, to push the button. Yeah, I'm a, I want to explore. So I use multimedia tech sets for that purpose. Some people call them choice boards. Some people call them whatever you want to call them. Uh, we did not invent those. We make those all the time. We have many courses on how to make them uh, here. Multimedia tech sets. Um, and they are fabulous under, yeah, courses. Um, under um, uh, getting started. Those are, uh, yeah, teaching with multimedia tech sets. How to create a multimedia tech set. We call those the gateway to Hyperdocs because that is a very important tool that allows you to offload your lecture, curate it in one place, and then teach kids how to slow down and explore. They don't have to explore every single link on a tech set. I want them to get lost in curiosity. I want them to be stuck in one square for three days because they're learning so much. So we have to build that comprehension for Here's my expectation for exploration and not make it about tasks to complete. Cause they'll say, how many squares do I have to do? Yeah. And they go check, check, check. Okay. I'm done. And I say, Oh no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. So when here's how you fix this up in a remote situation and the classroom is great because we would always, um, I'd have them share their thinking in the center. I'd always link a Padlet and I'd teach from that Padlet in class. I'm now going to, that's what my zoom call is about. I'm not going to um, take the time for the Zoom call to lecture them on any of the squares. I'm going to say, I want you to explore. I want you to do some thinking. Be curious. Have wonders, questions, aha. My Zoom is now going over all your reflections, your questions, your ahas, and I can go into some depth with that and actually um, raise their level, raise my expectation for that thinking time and saying, boy, I'm looking for you to really express yourself deeply. Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. Whoever wrote this one, this reflection, um, next time, we're going to try this again tomorrow, I want you to show me um, some deeper thinking. And so that's a really important part. Again, at the end of this experience, ask them how they felt as a learner today. Ask them how they felt as, um, uh, how what was their curiosity like? What was it like to have choice? What was it like to slow down and explore and have that metacognitive time to process your expectations of them as a learner. You are not assigning a bunch of tasks to get through. This is how you move from assigning to instructing. Mm -hmm. Very important piece. Now, Lisa, how much does all this cost? Free. I mean, okay, so it's free for teachers, but what do you guys charge districts? How much does it cost for a district? You you stumped me. Still free? (laughs) 
<laughs> for free. What are you talking about? It's all free. There's no trick. It's all free. Yeah. We created Teachers Give Teachers for this very purpose. And um, a little pun to the name there, it is correct. Uh, we believe um, in our Facebook group um, under Hyperdocs, uh, it's a huge community, um, really fast growing, where people are just sharing that. They're not only sharing that, they're collaborating on how they build these lessons. And it's really an incredible process um, that uh, that's free. Now our brand new academy, I'm very excited. For those of you, since uh, we've been working on this for two years um, and we're very excited we're launching this, we have a lot of remote teaching um, uh, less courses here and multiple lessons, but we are launching um, in the first weeks of August, our entire academy. We have hundreds of lessons in here that teach you not just how to make a hyperdoc, but why make hyperdocs, how to deliver them, how to design them. So it's really that how to teach with them. So instead of thinking in terms of professional development that I can um, just get my fill from two days of the fall Q conference, which I love that, um, I want you to be able to have access to that kind of instruction when you need it, which is all the time. And that's our academy. It's there for you. Um, lots of examples, lots of um, samples, lots of video tutorials. Um, we're looking for best practices for how you are as an adult learner. So we're excited. And I absolutely love that. I mean, I have always said that we became teachers for one reason, and that's to change the lives of students. And if we make an amazing lesson, no matter if it took hours or days, if we made an amazing lesson, who did we make it for? Students. Yep. And who can deliver it to students? Teachers. So that lesson belongs to everybody. Yep. And so, I mean, my heart jumps every time I hear teacher give teachers because that's exactly the way it should work. And 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 it, and it, just, it just warms my heart. Yeah. To hear your story, I love that, Lisa. I love everything that you're doing. I love what you're giving to education, and I love your passion. We can hear that in your voice. So, I mean, you are you are a joy uh, and, and a gift to us. So, we just extremely appreciate it. And I, I don't want anybody to forget that Lisa and your Hyperdocs team is going to be keynoting the Fall Q 2020 virtual conference yeah. along with Andrew Arevalo. And so we are super excited yeah. to have you and your team there because, like I said, you are changing mm -hmm. lives right now. You are really creating an accessible tool for free that is going to make this distance learning situation that we're in at the moment um, unbelievable. Yeah. And and don't forget, it's something that they can take back to the class when things are turned to hybrid or turn back face-to-face. -face. This isn't something yeah. you learn and then you're done. This is something that changes your teaching approach forever. Yeah, and it's not it's not just feel good, although Lisa, you're really good at making people happy and feel good. And it's, and it's not just gadgets, although Lisa, you're a Google certified uh, teacher. Jatawa. YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube star teachers. Um, <laughs> It's really about the pedagogy of it. It's yeah. the mindset. It's yeah. it's uh, and and what I love for me the the ultimate plane uh, is that uh, teachers use a couple of teachers give teachers templates and they're mm -hmm. like hey that's kind of cool yeah. and then teachers are building them yeah. and then my favorite part is you get about six or eight weeks down the road and you can go into the kids and go okay you need three tables four links tell me all about volcanoes you yeah. build it and yeah. that's when the party really starts people don't even realize. The hyperdocs made by teachers are just the entree for the real party. Exactly right. Student created content and learning from your classmates, bringing authentic purpose to your classroom. This is how we can do this remote instruction. Absolutely. Lisa, thank you so much for, for sharing your super share, your smart starts. Thank you so much for what you do for education. And thank you so much for being our very first guest. I don't think I could have thought of anybody I don't, I don't want to say better because I don't want to say that, but any anybody more important that I think we can have on the show right away. So thank you so much. And one quick question from the audience. Maybe you can answer it in the Facebook uh, chat from Guadalupe. How could this be modified for TK students learning in a target language that's not their home language? So I know you have answers for that, but we, we need a transition. But if you might follow up with Guadalupe, Guadalupe there in the chat. Yes, yes. It's a great question. Yes. 
and, 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 and the reason we do this is so the conversations in the chats can happen and start a conversation and sharing can begin. Don't, don't be fearful of posting something that you're doing and say, Hey, check this out or Hey, share this. That's exactly what we're here for. So don't think it's just a conversation between Lisa, John and I, this is a conversation with you and, and, and we're with you all the way. So please share, share, share in the chats, whether you're hearing this now or hearing this at a later date. So please, that's exactly what these super shares are about. And Lisa, before we let you go, I would just like you to, to give one message, one more thing to teachers on, on, on their return in the fall. Just because once again, there are some teachers that are just fearful. Um, and we want to make sure that they aren't fearful when fall is coming. <laughs> I think my one message is it's uh, one day, one lesson at a time. Get to your Friday and then reflect. Reflect with your kids. Reflect with your the parents of your students and say, how can we shift and make this work for all of us next week? Mm -hmm. we'll try again. And don't think that you are going to start off and this is how it's going to be. You have to revise and edit all the time. Be a reflective educator. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. And, and thank you for being a keynote for our fall. We are super excited about our virtual fall conference. Let's check in on how it's going. Yes. I'll give you a couple months. I'll see you in October. And then we're going to check in on how this, the tips are going. Oh, absolutely. We're going oh, like to be doing, doing a lead up to fall, but we're going to be doing a lead up to fall queue and to fall. So absolutely. Yeah. We're going to be sharing, sharing, sharing. Thanks. So thank you so much, Lisa. And, and please don't be a stranger to the show. You're welcome anytime. Thanks. And Guadalupe says, thank you. <laughs> Bye, Lisa. Thank you. John, that was amazing. I mean, oh, I mean, yeah. we, we, we've known Lisa for, for a long time, and, and she's just a, a, a great person. Um, but really, I mean, HyperDocs is something that can be used pretty easily uh, and oh, readily. Incredibly easily. Um, well, I, we've got her in the green room, so I can still see her blushing and giggling <laughs> while we're talking about her. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, I mean, if, if anybody's like maybe a little bit old school, like I I liked web quests as an idea back in the day. Like the web quest idea was great, but then I would download these PDFs and there were like eight pages long. I was like, this web quest will take four weeks. And I was like, where's the fun part? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to plan those. And so to me, there's the essence there, what Lisa and, and, and Sarah and Kelly are doing with the HyperDocs concept that it's, it's really the highest level of scaffolding, right? You, 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 it's I do, I made you do this thing. And all I need to know today is a link to your favorite sports team, your favorite kind of food, uh, tell me your favorite shoe and your favorite artist. And then they can tell you in several ways by a picture, by writing, right? And so that's a, just a really good framework. And then you speed it up a little bit and then you go tell me about osmosis and now we're getting technical. And then after a while you go, oh, now you guys are gonna work as a group to make your own stuff. And so there's this really cool SEL piece of that where kids know they can build and discuss. And, and I don't think Lisa touched on that part, but there's definitely an SEL component to this, which is I can navigate in the modern world. I can make sense of things and I can relate those to other people in ways that get them excited and interested. There is a lot of mental health going on with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and mental, I mean, Working from home, students learning from home. There's a lot of mental health things that mm -hmm. that need to be thought about. And and what 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 uh what Lisa and and Kelly and Sarah are doing is they're not just giving a tool. They're also giving a uh, an opportunity for those teachers to create their own. There is no better feeling than when a teacher can create something on their own and then give it to their students and see that that it actually works. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean. You, you grab something from a pre-made textbook something, which is never always that great, right? I mean, ditch that textbook, right? That's what Matt mm -hmm. always says. But when you make it on your own and you see the eyes light up of students, that is an amazing feeling. And, and you go, that's why I'm an educator. And that's why it's I'm a, a creator. It's the difference between being a worksheet slinger or a curriculum de delivery tool for a district and being a true crafts person of what you do. And, th and there, there's a difference there. Uh, and no offense to the Applebee's fans that out, are out there. We've got 31 viewers and probably 50% like Applebee's. But, man, those guys are people just microwaving. They are not really cooking that food. I don't mean to break you up on that. But, <laughs> so, you know, so 
the thing is you, you want to be like, as a teacher, for me, you want to be that sweet uh, food truck, right? you got the super cool menu. you got the best sauces. Um, you've got cool shirts. you got social media. Like that whole thing is what we should be aiming for. And I, I think in the old days, the, the, the old days of school, um, it was like, ooh, I want to be like all the other people. And I don't think that's where we're going. No, absolutely. And and a, a, a teachers right now are going to be bombarded with opportunities. They're going to be bombarded with different tools that, that they're going to be asked to use or they're going to be shown and they think they have to use them. And I want, before we bring Eric on, who's going to really show you some amazing things and, and give you some real good encouragement, I want you to think of that game Whack-A-Mole. John, you remember that game Whack-A-Mole? Um, oh, you know, yeah. when, when I was younger, I, I, would, I would play that game and I was not very good. And um, I would want to hit every mole all the way through. And I would always miss every single one and I'd get no tickets. And my grandpa told me, he said, he goes, why are you so frustrated? I go, I'm working so hard and I'm not hitting any of these and I'm not getting any tickets. And he goes, well then just find one hole and hit mm -hmm. it. And you'll hit that, that mole every time I go, but then I won't win a lot of tickets. He goes, how many tickets did you win when you worked harder? I was like, Oh, <laughs> that's, that's right. So I'd hit that hole and I'd get five tickets. And he goes, when you're comfortable, go for another hole. And when you're mm -hmm. comfortable, go for another one. He goes, the moment you add too many holes and you you earn less tickets, stop. Go back stop. to what you were doing. Keep learning new things until you until you're comfortable, and then move on to another one. That's my that's my recommendation. That's my advice to you, teachers out there. Find yeah. one thing, get really good at it, and then add another one mm -hmm. to your action. Well, and if we're doing dad stories, my dad's story when I was about ten. Um, we were at his place of work. They they were like a welding shop, construction fabricator place. And he goes, see that over there? That's been broken for three weeks. I'm going to go fix it. He goes, if you fix one thing a day, at the end of the year, you fixed almost 400 things. And it's the same way in teaching, right? So you might say, oh my God, I don't know all of these apps. But there's a point you would just go, okay, it's Pear Deck day. It's Flipgrid day. I'm going to crank that thing open and start pushing the buttons. <laughs> and I got to tell you, 70% of the time when I do that, uh, like 10 minutes in, I'm going, why did I not do this a year ago? This is so <laughs> awesome. And so, and it's really just that sense of like what you're saying, Joe, managing what your cognitive load is. I'm not going to do everything. And like, you know, I do the edge of protocol stuff. And at the end of a, a session, we tell people very clearly, do not do all of these. You will hurt yourself. Grab two. Do them in one subject. When you feel good after three or four weeks, add a third one. By Christmas time, you'll have 10. You'll be fine. Right? Absolutely. Oh, I love it. Angela jumped in. Angela uh, Shamalabad. She goes, it's Gimkit Kit Day. You're going to love it, Angela. <laughs> it's, it's, today's the day. Spend 20 minutes. You'll love it. It's the, it's the most fun thing. It is so fun. And 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 uh, John, you've met the GimKit creator. That he was a high school yeah, in Seattle, right? That's amazing. Yeah, amazing he's story. Just, he's only a year out of high school. My favorite part of his story is, Hated math loves programming. Let that sink in for a second. Hated math, programmer for a living. Wow. Maybe we're not getting the question right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I want to show one more thing Angela said. I love the Mohawk. Angela, oh, yeah. Th now's the time to take risks, right? I mean, uh, our, our whole lives, professional, 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 but, but we're, yeah, we're, we're right there's a book in the, fun, in the so. quotes. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you jump into the, into the comments and read Lisa's short story she just sent in. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I want to now bring in our next our next guest, um, Eric Cross, um, um, and he's got some amazing things to tell us. And I, I'm going to go ahead and bring him in. John, are you ready? I'm always ready, bro. All right this here we is go. Exciting for me because Lisa said Eric's super cool and he makes her cry, so I want to cry too now. Yeah, and then Lisa told me that she doesn't cry, so I'm not sure how to feel about that. Ooh, but, uh, I'm not a crier either. <laughs> Good to see you, Jane Jay. Yeah, hey, I like that. I know, I like that. On you know, the air with Jane Jay, that's a new logo. That's a new logo we're going to have to bring out. I was sitting here listening Wait, to you guys. Jane Jay Pedagogy Factory. <laughs> that's true. You know, which one you guys are going to dance? <laughs> there we go, right there. <laughs> All right. Well, I was, it, it's, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to follow Lisa. Lisa's that was amazing. Um, but it's, uh, it's yeah. pretty easy. You just go on Twitter and hit follow. Then you can yeah. follow Lisa. Yeah. Well, I was already doing Facebook, Except it's called liking <laughs> and friending. It's the same basic idea though. Well, yeah, my name is Eric Cross. I'm a uh, seventh grade science teacher down here in San Diego, California. I teach at a school called Albert Einstein Academy, charter school, international baccalaureate, which is yeah, a lot. No pressure. Say. No pressure, bro. <laughs> it's a lot to say. Um, and I have 200 amazing students. Uh, I also oversee the seventh grade team. So uh, that means everything is not my fault, but everything is my responsibility, as is middle management. 
um, a lot of times. And then when I'm not teaching the little ones, I teach the big ones at the University of San Diego. I'm an adjunct teacher there um, for pre-service teachers. But uh, what know, I wanted to sh share, I think, well, Joe- Eric, I want to say one thing. S middle school science teachers are one of my favorite groups of educators. And I'm not just saying that because I was an eighth grade science teacher for 10 years. I think middle school science teachers just do so many fun and innovative and engaging experiments with their kids that that it just breeds a, a, just a mindset that is is amazing. Every middle school science teacher I've ever met uh, is just joyful and and loving and just innovative. So uh, it's no surprise to me that you were you are a middle school science teacher. Thanks, Joe. It's a uh, yeah. My first unit is on fecal transplants. So oh, that kind yeah, of that's middle school, baby. <laughs> that is middle school right hey, there. That's a load of, oh wait, sorry. I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> it, it literally is. Yeah. Edutainment is part of our job for sure. <laughs> and I love edutainment. Yeah. Wow. What a great smart start. Who would you rather gather fecal matter from? That's a good one. A thin slide on that. Well, wait until I bring it into economics. And I tell them that they can get paid for it. $40. Oh, for donation. Nice. I, oh yeah. There'll be, you'll be need, you'll need to print new bathroom passes after get that. Paid. <laughs> What took you so long? Just doing homework. Just trying to get some money. <laughs> that is hilarious. So, so you, Eric, so you're a, a seventh grade science teacher whose first lesson is going to be on fecal matter. Um, what what can you what, what can you share? What's your super share with our audience here today? I think the first thing that I would say is. Um, it's important to allow our expectations to be adjusted for the circumstances and meeting with teachers and talking with teachers. Um, we were comparing online instruction and all mm -hmm. elements to what it was like in the classroom. And what, would, mm -hmm. what was happening is it was creating despair. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's no way that you're going to be able to match the two. And mm -hmm. the re the reality is we should have been comparing it to what would have been, been like maybe 15, 10 years ago. These would have been snow days or maybe packets and books mm -hmm. that got collected. Mm -hmm. And so if, Many of us left the class, tried to go online and found like maybe 50% engagement rate, 30% engagement rate, work completion. And we were comparing that to who we were in the classroom, 190% engagement rate. And we were feeling defeated when in reality, we should have been. I was winning. 50% was winning given exactly. the situation. Yeah. Exactly. If you now it's kind of like, well, here in San Diego and you guys in the Bay Area know about this better than I do. The only ones in California that can complain higher than I can home prices. So if you bought a home and you lost 50 percent equity, you'd be really sad. Mm -hmm. But if you bought a house and it appreciated 30 percent or 40 percent, you'd be doing backflips mm -hmm. that all of you teachers who have been transitioning and pivoting to online distance learning through force, not by your own choice as navigated to it, but out of a reaction, you've been providing learning in a way that couldn't have happened 10 years ago. So even if you're getting those 30 or 40%, I think our expectations need to be modified. When my kids are with me, I can control the environment. I can make sure that they're fed. I can make sure that they're safe. I can make sure that they're encouraged. But when they're home, we know that that affects learning. And I think it really starts with teachers really kind of calibrating a realistic expectation for ourselves so we can kind of take that weight because nobody is harder on a teacher than a teacher. We, we always walk around, we're talking to people all the time and teaching. We feel that imposter syndrome. We have an expectation for ourselves that's higher than we'll ever achieve. And I think for teachers, allowing ourselves the kindness to know that with these different circumstances, we need to have different expectations for ourselves. Now, we can still keep a high standard for our students, but we do need to also allow more grace. Um, in, in this time period. So I think that's one of the big things I would encourage teachers about. That is hilarious. Not hilarious, like, oh, that's funny, but, but hilarious because I had that exact same conversation with a teacher from Idaho this morning because they were talking about standards and meeting goals and this and that. I go, look, distance learning is a completely different beast than face-to-face. -face. And your expectations of going through all the standards are not going to be the same. And so I said, you're going to hear that term learning loss over and over and over again. I go, but can you really call earning loss when students are gaining knowledge along the way, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really learning loss. It's they're not meeting the expectations that you wanted in a face-to-face -face mentality. But are they meeting your expectations? Are they meeting creativity? Are they, are they meeting um, 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 what you want to get out of them 
in that distance learning environment, right? So I don't like that term learning loss. You can't lose when you're gaining along. I'm going to see if I can make Lisa cry because she's still in the green room. Um, if you if you have a, a parent or great grandparent or grand grandparent who who grew up in the depression. They have a very keen sense of material things are not important. They know how to save money. They know how to grow their vegetables and probably can them, right? And I saw a really cool post, and I don't know, I don't think I curated it well enough. I'm gonna have to drag it up. But basically, it said, What if this group of kids is gonna be more in touch with what matters than any group of kids in the last 50 years? What if this group of kids knows how to have a nice, quiet morning, drinking some tea, reading a book? What if this group of kids knows how to interact better with people and values relationships? I will tell you, uh, Joe, at Minarets High School, when you li when I listened to their uh, commencement speeches, every one of those kids said basically that they had learned that life is finite. That is a big thing for an 18-year-old, that everything could disappear any minute and that they were going to do their best to try to live all their life with that in mind, that every day matters. Did I get you, Lisa? Misty at all? Nothing at all? Nothing? Kelly, maybe? Did I get Kelly? <laughs> but I think that's true. I think that it's 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 unfortunate to foist things upon people and make presumptions because of what was. Like my favorite little joke, and I'll give it back to you, Eric. Uh, we can't give kids detention in a Zoom environment. Hmm. You can't tell kids to stay after the bell in a Zoom environment. You can't deny them a trip to the bathroom or nachos for that matter, right? So uh, is that good or bad? My, my say is just different, man. It's just different. You just have to adapt to what is and stop pining away for what is not, right? Yep. Yeah. And I think the big term, Eric, is, is when you said grace. Mm -hmm. We need to give grace, right? So I'd love to hear more. Yeah, and John, to come behind you, uh, for my Google Innovator project, I, I uh, combined VR with soft skills. And my research mm -hmm. behind it was Google's Project Oxygen. So they researched their teams and they asked them the top eight skills for their executives. The top seven of the eight skills were all soft skills. Number eight mm -hmm. was a STEM skill. And so mm -hmm. those heart skills are amazing. The one I've seen this come out with my students who are demonstrating and speaking out loud and speaking truth to power. This generation of students that are coming up are more emotionally intelligent and in tune um, across the board than any of my generation growing up. It's one of the things that make me most proud is that we're developing their heart as well as their mind. Mm -hmm. um, but to mm -hmm. come behind Lisa, I think one of the other things that's important is creating culture early. Uh, it's, it's good teaching is good teaching, whether it's in person or in, in, on, the, on distance learning, on Zoom. And so I encourage my own teachers to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. So mm -hmm. a thermostat controls the temperature of a room and a thermometer responds to it. And our mm -hmm. kids are going to create the culture if we don't. And if they do, sometimes it's Lord of the Flies. And so when we create that culture, there's some things that we can do. And even now, being proactive, before school begins, getting parents on board and learning our students' stories, especially in this time period, learning each other's stories when everyone's listening is more important than ever. And mm -hmm. with the tech, it actually enables us to do it easier. Mm -hmm. We can do parent Zoom sessions. We don't have to wait to open house where everyone comes in. Let's get everyone on board and start having some open and honest conversations. Hey, look, I'm not in charge of mass and districts opening. I love kids. I teach science. My job is to encourage your young person as much as possible and equip them with the skills they need. The more you can make your parents as partners, I think it's more important than ever, especially since we can't control their environment. You really need those parents on board for accountability and for support. Mm -hmm. And then I'd also say under the, the, you know, the, the law of unintended consequences, I've had many friends of mine who had kids this spring as classroom teachers telling me that while a certain group of kids maybe went off the radar and a certain group of kids did not like this setting, there was a whole other group that liked this educational experience. The introverts, the quiet thinkers, um, some of the kids who are not uh, physically comfortable school. Cause I know that it's very popular to say school keeps kids away from uh, sometimes rough home lives, but school can be rough. And so it's almost like four or five different groups. And one of the subgroups is, I think this is pretty cool for a group of kids. I'm not ready to say big or small, but there's definitely a group of kids that liked last spring educationally. Absolutely. Yeah. We were able to, to reach and our students who are self-directed or, or who had the resources 
to be able to access these materials online or felt yeah. safe. A lot of my students, especially in middle school, when you're going through the point where you're the biologically, your emotional volatility is at its highest and your desire mm -hmm. for learning is at its lowest. It's this crazy crossroads. And Joe, mm -hmm. you know about this being an eighth grade science teacher. You know, it's, it, is, it is intense. And a lot of my students in full transparency said, you know what, being able to work alone while I miss my friends, I actually focused really well. Yeah. And, and there was something in that. It's, it's what most of the college experience is like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, why is that not weird? Yeah. They, they love the autonomy. And so um, I think that the, going back to just some practical tips for teachers, one, uh, doing parent meetings earlier before the school year starts, connecting with those parents, start building those allies. So many teachers, when school year starts, the first interaction you have with this, with a parent is like an email that they're missing their homework. Like, no, 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 no. Get them in a Zoom chat, have someone moderate it, have some structured questions and just let them have that connection. Next is like, get a Google voice number, get a burner number. Since you're not, since you're not in the uh, physical classroom, you can get a burner Google voice number yeah. and then parents can contact you that way. You could even shut it off and you can do um, screen your calls that way too. I've had this for years. Um, greeting students by name when they come online and just this little things like when you're storytelling, uh, I, I tell a story with my students and you can see uh, as oh, I start talking about awesome. when I was younger. That was awesome. When I was a young spud growing up. <laughs> amazing. And so I wanted to blow my students' minds. And so I was doing whatever I could to keep them engaged. And then when we went distance learning, we found ourselves in a pickle, right? It was yeah. this difficult spot. So as a science teacher, it was my job to come up with whatever tools I could um, to get my kids engaged. So since we've been wearing the mask, I've been trying to figure out whatever I can to just blow you know, my students' like, minds. This is like free verse. He's doing like free verse right now. <laughs> it's it's like like spoken word teaching. Oh my God, that's awesome. So by, by front loading and building this culture, whether it's digital tools or being intentional about relationships, um, Zaretta Hammond, culturally uh, responsive teaching in the brain, Gloria Billing Ladson about culturally uh, responsive teaching. All of these things are really great practices to have. Um, and once you've built that relationship, now when you need your students to do something, you're leveraging your relationship and not your authority. And I think that's powerful, not just for the classroom, but leaders and teachers, everywhere. And by the way, that tool that I was using is called Snap Camera. It's free. It's on PC and Mac for teachers that are interested in it. And I use it in my Zoom chats and in my Google Hangouts and Meets and things like that. It's a lot of fun. And I love that. And a couple of things I just, just came to mind. One, Snap I think camera. we need a segment called Crossroads with Eric just giving a segment. So that's, that's one thing. But another thing is that Snap Camera really creates engagement, right? So I call those educational squirrels. You do something where they can't not look away. You give them the knowledge, you give them an activity, you give them something, right? And then they go off and do it. That's an amazing thing. And you give them pizza, just like that. Um, but also Snap, um, Snapchat, they have their own creator as well. So students can create their own lenses. And so that could be something that you do, right? Teach them something. If you're in, in English class, they go off and create like a book surrounding them. They can do all that right out of Snapchat and that's free as well. So I love that you brought that up because it just opens up a whole world of possibilities in the distance learning environment. And Joe, I love that because that is getting our students from becoming content consumers to content creators. And with this digital space, we have more power to do that than ever. Our students mm -hmm. can graphics design, they can make podcasts, they can make videos, they can do all kinds of rad things. And <laughs> since they're all stuck inside, there's a lot of motivation to do it. And 10 bonus points for saying rad, Eric. Good job. <laughs> I'm dating myself, but yeah, um, the snap lens is great, Joe. It's in my queue right now for a project that I want to do with students is having them be able to make that, those things. Yeah, there's, they're so, they're so fun and, and you showed it, right? Because you, you see when you instantly turned yourself into a 10 year old little boy, um, John was like, what, what is going on here? It's sorcery. Whoa, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and can you can you can you imagine starting the school year with that lens on? And go, where's the teacher? Where's Probably the don't teacher? want to start the first parent conference that way. <laughs> no, they don't want. They don't. They definitely don't want to see that. <laughs> hey, you got, well, that's current. All I've got is bad dad jokes because I don't really understand ed tech. <laughs> so and this is this. See, this, we are virtual right now. We're having a great conversation, but we yeah. elevated it by using some innovative uses of it and it just because we've been zooming for so long right 
things like that break up the monotony, brings back the joy in the teaching. And that's what we need. Bring back the joy in the teaching. And I want to bring back the joy. Lisa, I want to bring Lisa back for some parting words. As we like how I did that segue, John. Yep. That was yeah. smooth. Back from the green room. Lisa, <laughs> oh, look at that. Just, uh, Kelly gave me some tissues. That is so nice. <laughs> it's because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> I didn't know it was that kind of crying. So laughing, you like laughing, crying. crying. Laughing through tears. Then he gets this touching point. <laughs> um. So I, I want to say something to kind of end. I want to get your your thoughts. Okay, I'm gonna so I'm gonna put up a quote up up, up on the screen. So this is by Todd Rose. Uh, J John gave me uh, told me to read this book, and I and I, I did read I, the book, and you did, and yep. it changed everything, right? End of average by Todd Rose. You have to read this book. Um, but one of the things that he said, I had to stop my car because I was listening to the audiobook and and write this down because I could not forget it. He was saying, look, the hardest part of learning something new is not embracing new ideas. Teachers can embrace new ideas. Teachers can go out there and try new things. The hardest thing is letting go of the old ones. The hardest thing is going to be to let go of your face-to-face -face teaching and embracing distance learning. The moment you let go of that, that is like a monkey off your back. You are going to part those curtains and you're going to see the light and you're going to see the joy. You're going to see the opportunities. You're going to see everything in a different light. When you let go of the old, right? I, I'm, I'm picturing let it go right now. I don't, I don't want that in my head, but I got, I got two oh, young. Oh, you're earworming us real bad, bro. But, but I, but I also want you to think of this. We have to have empathy for our teachers, and and let me tell you why. So my grandma is 97 years old. She is one of the best cooks I've ever seen or eaten from. She makes the best homemade tamales, the best homemade chili verde, the best uh, Spanish, or she made, is the best, right? And she uses old school cast iron. Everything is old school. She crushes her own chilies to make her own sauce. It's amazing, okay? She is a great cook. But now imagine this. Imagine that I said, Grandma, you have to use a sous vide. You have to. You're a you cook. You're an amazing cook. You have to use the sous vide. I don't know how to use it. I don't know what that is. I just want to go back to my own cooking. No, you can only use it. Everything else in the house is gone. You have to use the sous vide. It's going to cause, it's going to cause anxiety. It's going to cause pause. It's going to cause trepidation. We have to be willing to say, no worries. I'm going to show you how to use it. No worries. Your seasoning is phenomenal. Your, your beef is the best. Do all of that. I will show you how to put it in the sous vide. That is our job. That is our part. We have to have empathy for the teachers that are amazing, but are just frightened for the fall. We have to do this because we're in this together and we want every teacher to succeed because we want every student to succeed. So I just want to hear your guys' parting thoughts or your thoughts on that, or if you've ever used a souvet. Um, I just want to hear you because that's what I think about. Now, well, now I want a souvet. So <laughs> I'm not sure if your example totally worked. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good point. If you're good at something and you're getting the results you want, keep it, right? And then if you're not getting the results you want, go shopping. Look for new ideas. And that's what I love about, about uh, HyperDocs in particular is they provide a very clear model for what to do. It's, you, you don't need a 16-week course to figure it out. Uh, you, you, you might fool around for a couple evenings and test drive it on your husband or your kids. But in the end, it's good teaching. It's just a slightly different timing. It's like the difference between Chinese food and Thai food. You know, it, the, chi the Thai food has more hot sauce and, and cashews and some unexpected elements. But it's not that different than Chinese food. It's not totally different. If you know one, the others are relatable. This whole metaphor is making me really hungry right now. <laughs> we, we go really deep on the foods, bro. We go deep on the foods. Yellow curry. That's all I want. <laughs> yellow curry. But well, and I'm, I'm trying to bring up a graphic, you guys. Uh, if, if there's anybody that's listening that's saying, well, you guys, this sounds good, but I'm pretty good. I, I think I got this. Like, I, I feel good about my, my class and my school. Um, there's a book by a guy named Ted Dintersmith, 
and uh, I'm going to share the screen here real quick. It's just taking a second to load because I have 47 video things going at once. Um, but basically, guys, the results that we've gotten in education for the last 50 years are essentially flat. Reading, math, and science scores are essentially flat since 1970. And so this is, this is uh, I'm going to pop this up here real quick. Uh, share, there we go. And uh, I'm going to just show this screen here real quick. This graphic says it all for me. Okay, so 19, 1970. Look at this. Look at the graph line right here, you guys. It didn't go up or down because of No Child Left Behind. It didn't go up or down because of MySpace or the invention of the iPhone or the appearance of YouTube. It's always flat. And I think, Lisa, you like this quote. You know why it's always flat? Because that's how we always teach. We always teach the same way. We always get the same result, right? Yeah. So there, there's actual data science behind the fact that as a collective, and I don't want to offend any one teacher or district, because I know there's some really good teachers, some really good teachers. Uh, you, me, and Joe were some of them, but we didn't make a dent in the bigger pile, right? And, and I believe Eric's a great teacher, but as a profession, we're not getting results, which going back to the whack-a-mole thing, Joe, we have the freedom to try some because what we're doing isn't going up or down. And that's that chart. Uh, I only showed it briefly, but that wasn't us versus Finland or us versus some country where teachers are well paid or, you know, some monoculture, some easy to place teach. Maybe Moldavia is easy because they only have 900 kids or something like that. That that was us against us. That was our expectations and our results. So to me, that gave me a lot of freedom when I saw that two years ago. I go, you know what? I'm going to sail this ship right out of this harbor because I, I will end with this quote. Uh, Ships weren't made to stay in harbors get out there and enjoy things, but be mindful of the whack-a-mole and be mindful of, of not trying to do too much and be mindful of keeping what you're good at. Cause you don't want to stress yours out yourself out on Joe's brand new wacky kitchen gadgets. And that's, that's basically the gist. It's give yourself grace, give your students grace, maintain great communication with your parents. Cause they are, they are now your co-teacher. They are now your co-teacher and they need to know. So use Eric's communication tips. I mean, Google Voice, like he said, is a great mm -hmm. option for that. Remind has always been around for something like that. I've seen teachers utilize Flipgrid for 24-7 office hours and 24-7 parent questions, 24-7 parent questions. So be creative, but be there, be present and just be yourself. With small tweaks to your amazing teaching, with small tweaks, distance learning doesn't seem so daunting. With small tweaks, you're going to do amazing things. And I'll tell you what, fall is going to be tough. Fall is going to feel like a huge <laughs> on your um, love the sound effects. It's okay. It's, it's, I'm just doing that spontaneously too. I need to practice. <laughs> so fall is going to be tough, but teachers are tougher. We have overcome a multitude of challenges. We've overcome overcrowding in our classroom. We've overcome bad textbooks. We've overcome a variety of things. We're going to overcome this, but we're going to do it together. We're going to do it together because I'm going to end with this. And then John and Lisa and Eric, you can say one last thing as well. Teaching is a collaborative sport. And if you are doing it alone, you are doing it wrong. So anybody like any parting words? I'll do a fast one. And I'm stealing it from George Kuros teaching by yourself is a choice that's a you're making a decision to not collaborate because the collaboration tools are there so that's mine don't don't go it alone people go ahead eric i'll let you go i'm still thinking okay um <laughs> I, I want to encourage teachers that now is the time to experiment while we're in this kind of disarray it does create opportunity for us mm -hmm. and so to try things while they're trying to figure out whether they're going to do standardized tests or not Sweet. You're not, you don't know. All right. I'm going to try some things because it's low risk now for tests that I don't even really know if they even support learning or not. Um, also, we've been doing the same way of education for a hundred years. 
And then all of a sudden we switch to electric cars and some people in our world are asking, where do I put the saddle? Where do I put the bridle? And then they're asking the wrong question. And so be yeah. mindful of that. Um, we've switched to a whole different way of thinking. Things are changing. Get Lean into it. And that's okay. Like that discomfort, that tension that I don't know, that's part of the journey. And I can mm -hmm. tell you as someone who's been doing this for a little while in the classroom, I, I, I now I, I live for those new tensions and those innovations and, and pushing students to expose them to new things and new ideas, because by exposing them to these new things, I'm giving them new opportunities. Um, and it's another way to be able to support equity by getting these kinds of tools and these innovative ideas into our students' hands who need it the most. Mm -hmm. That's Thank you, Eric. I'm, I, uh, my last thing is I know um, a lot of you are remembering in the spring, you were exhausted and you were really worn out and to build up that stamina for what you're about to um, embrace, embark on. And so maybe do a little Marie Kondo of what you're delivering and find what brings you joy in order to, uh, you know, build that energy because it's that joy that you bring to the classroom, that energy that can help you sustain and to do really well. Here he goes again. <laughs> I need to be in Eric's class. Can I? Uh, me too. <laughs> I, I just want to see the actual costumes he has now because this can't be the first time you've done this. I, I could just imagine yeah. you in class with all. Yeah, your I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he has some real, real costumes out, out there too. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I'll be Eric, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this first episode of, of super shares. And, and as you can tell, you know, it's about amazing tips and techniques that teachers can use, but it's also about building our Q community together so that we know that teachers, um, we have your back. Um, we, we, we know your struggles and we're here to help. We're here to collaborate and we're here to be there for you, for your students and for anything that you need. And, and uh, John, Thank you so much for being the mentor to me that you always have. And it is an honor that I get to succeed you in your role as the Director of Academic Innovation for Q. And I promise I will do you proud. And I will continue with your mantra of Q and we are here with lifetime tech support. Because when we are teachers, we are together and we are Q. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you so much for just being an amazing educator and an amazing um, facilitator of change for our students and our industry. So thank you so much and have yourselves a wonderful Thursday evening. It was great to meet you, Eric. Likewise. <laughs> See you guys.